am Nadia Hashimi, and that is my book, The Pearl That Broke Its Shell. I'm really thankful to be here with all of you in a room full of educators, which is something that's really near and dear to my heart. I am a lifetime student. I spent a lot of time in school, years and years and years in years school. So to be around professors and people who feel that learning is important is really a great experience for me. So I was that nerdy kid who would kind of pour over the syllabus on the first day of a course or feel really important highlighting certain sections in the textbook and feeling really anxious to get back those little red comments in the margins from professors. I mean, I actually looked forward to that stuff, embarrassingly enough. And I went to Brandeis University, which is a smaller college, but it's right outside of Boston. It's not your typical college, so you don't really have the, we didn't have like a football team or things like that. Um, Brandeis has a very different flavor to it, and I think that flavor came across in the courses that I took there. And I remember being a freshman at Brandeis and being herded, because there's really no other way to describe the freshman experience, but being herded into an auditorium where we were each given a copy of our freshman read. And for our freshman year, the book was Chinua Achibi's Things Fall Apart. And I remember holding the yellow and red book in my hands and thinking, I just got a free book. College is going to be so cool. They're just going to be giving you free stuff all the time. <laughs> Tuition happened later, and you know reality sank in. But so Chinua Chibi's book was about the European colonization of Africa, but he told the story through the eyes of the colonized people. And for me, that was the beginning of that college experience: was learning about things that were happening in my world, learning about things that were happening around me, but doing it through an unexpected perspective, because that's all of the difference in the world, really. And so as a pre-med student, I took my biology, my chemistry classes. I did all of my prerequisites the way I was supposed to do. But I complemented my courses with a bunch of classes that I just thought were really cool and interesting, because I figured, when else am I going to have the time to explore these topics with the guidance of a professor, somebody who actually knows about it? And at least this way, if I was majoring in my biology, my dad would still help me pay my tuition, right? <laughs> so I ended up taking women's literature classes and different things like that, and one in particular that my professor called Chicks and Bales. And I began to realize that there is so much you can learn about a society by reading the fiction that's born of it. So I graduated in 2000 with all these you know, reading materials in my head and ideas banging around. And fast forward to 2008, I'm a pediatrician. And I've got all my beloved books on my shelves. And I look at them longingly. And my overachieving husband tells me, I think you really want to start writing something. Why don't you do it? And so when I kind of got my head around the idea of actually writing, I had to sit down and think, well, if I did write, what would I write about? And then that was the easy part. So my family's from Afghanistan. My parents came over to the United States in the early 1970s. Um, my mother had just gotten her degree in engineering from Europe. They were planning on working in the United States for a few years and then returning to Afghanistan. And then the Soviet invasion happened. And Afghanistan was sort of thrown into this really rapid downward spiral. And the Afghan skies were darkened by rockets exploding. Tanks were plowing into the countrysides, and everybody was kind of dispersing and looking for safety. And so it never became a safe time for my parents to return home. We ended up staying here, and thus I was born in New York and instead of Afghanistan. And so that, that difference made me acutely aware growing up of what the experience of my counterparts was in Afghanistan, my cousins or other girls who were my age, who were growing up under these dark skies and under these years and years and years of war, an entire lifetime of war, and growing up under regimes that were so unspeakably cruel to women that they became worldwide infamous for it. And it became important for me to not take my education for granted and to talk about what it meant to be a girl in Afghanistan. Because I think if you look at being a girl in Afghanistan, that translates to so many other areas of the world. And there's always a way, even as exotic or foreign or crazy, as wild as a story might seem, there is always a way for it to connect back home. So The Pearl That Broke Its Shell is the story of two women. 
The older woman is Shikeba. She's born at the turn of the century into an Afghanistan that's ruled by monarchs and very limited rights for women, which at that time, in the early 1900s, there was really limited rights for women anywhere in the world. And she's disfigured early in her life, and then she becomes an orphan by a cholera epidemic that wipes out her family. And she, she becomes sort of a servant that's passed from home to home to home. And so despite all the things that are happening in her life, this woman, for some irrational reason, seems to believe that she's actually entitled to something more than what this world is telling her. She finds her way into the royal palace. And there was a time in Afghanistan's history where King Habibul actually used women dressed as men to guard his harem for fairly obvious reasons. I mean, if you've got all these harem wives in this beautiful palace, are you really going to put a bunch of men outside there to guard over them? Um, and so she becomes one of these cross-dressed harem guards. And by being in the royal palace, she is privy to a lot of the conversations that are happening there. She's privy to what the king is saying, what his advisors are telling him, what the intellectuals around them are talking about. And she starts to, starts to get a handle of how these people and these personalities, their little conversations are turning tides for people all over the countryside. And that's where she also meets the queen, Soraya, who's an actual figure in Afghan history. I've sort of taken liberties with these characters. But Queen Soraya, who really wants to champion a new age for Afghan women and really push for women's rights. The second storyline is the great-great-granddaughter of that character, and that's a contemporary girl in post-Taliban Afghanistan. She's the middle of five sisters, and she's born to a family with no sons. Now, in a deeply patriarchal society like Afghanistan, that is a really big deal. Because without a son, these families sort of feel like they don't have that honor. Other families will look at them and pity them. Oh, you don't have a son to carry on your family name and do all those boy things that they're supposed to do. And so there is a huge problem that Afghanistan has created by placing daughters here and sons here. And when you create a problem, you also have to create a solution for it. And so what Afghanistan has done is we have this custom called a bacha push. What we do is take one of your girls, and you can cut off her hair, and you can change her name, and change her clothes, and all of a sudden, she is your son. And that child can go out and engage with the rest of society in a way that a little girl could not. And that's what Rahima does. So she goes out into the marketplace and bargains with the shopkeepers. She sits in her classroom with freedom. She's able to walk into the street and play soccer with the other boys. And she enjoys this really short-lived freedom, only to have it taken away. And so when this happens in Afghanistan, what happens is that these girls are supposed to be transformed back before the age of puberty. Because as sexuality creeps in, the definition of gender takes on a whole other meaning. And then you really cannot have a girl, even if she's dressed as a boy, you cannot have a girl out and about with the rest of society. Um, and so this has, you know, when I start to put on my pediatrician hat, then this has a lot of developmental effects and psychological effects on the, on the well-being of a child. And what we've seen is that there are some girls who take on sort of this courage and feeling of entitlement from this, take this experience, and do really great things with it. Some of them go on to become either parliamentarians or other high-ranking officials in government or nurse anesthetists, professionals working outside of the home in a way that maybe they would have done had they not had the experience, or maybe they wouldn't. There's also a good deal of dysphoria. Um, when you have two different genders that are not just two different genders, but they're two different genders in a way that there's a hierarchy, living for a while as the opposite gender sort of gives you this I don't want to go back there feeling. And to have all those liberties taken away can be really jarring. Some have refused to marry. And I know of one individual who is pursuing a sex change operation because I, I mean, the, the experience was that deep-rooted into her psyche. So for the character Rahima, at the age of 13, her opium-addicted father decides to marry her off to a warlord. And she becomes the child bride, which is such a euphemism, but the child bride to this warlord and becomes his fourth wife. And that's a shock to her, not only because she's a child, but also because just a few days ago, she was a boy. And so in order to survive, she draws strength from her legacy, knowing that she descended from her great-great-grandmother and gets inspired by a woman who also boldly challenged her circumstances. And through the warlord's 
plans, Rahima, this young girl, becomes an assistant to a female parliamentarian in Kabul. And then she becomes a spectator to the inner workings of the parliament and sees how it functions in all its glory, its corruption, and its chaos. And she also sees, and there is a lot of corruption and chaos. I mean, <laughs> that part is real. Um, but she also gets to see how the decisions that are made by a few really impact the many. And she also gets this sense that she wants to make decisions for herself, which is what we all really want to do as we kind of come of age. We want to start making decisions for ourselves. So when I had the story in mind, I really wanted to talk about gender. And gender for me was something so best conveyed by a vehicle like the Becha Push, a person who has lived sort of on both sides of the line. Because gender is not a simple anatomic classification. And more and more in this country now, we're getting to know that, that it's not just about the anatomy that you're born with. It's, really, it's also a political construct. It's a sociological construct. And so you know, one of the characters, what she can inherit, what she cannot inherit, is gender associated. What expectations there are for their behaviors is based on gender. And then to have one of the characters cut her hair, put on pants, and all of a sudden, the world treats her in a different way, just that veneer of the opposite gender, well then, what is the real definition of gender in that case? And I was speaking recently with a professor of mine who I've been able to stay in touch with, and that's the professor from that Chicks and Veils class. And she read an advanced copy of the book. I'd sent it to her, and she was really excited to get it. I was really excited to send it to her. And so while she had it, I, to be honest, had like dreams of getting it back with red notes on the margins and a big, <laughs> like a B on the title page would have been horrible. But she didn't send it back to me. She called me, and we had a really nice conversation. And you know, we've talked often about her take on the story. And one of the things that she once mentioned was Jane Austen. And I was like, Jane Austen? Okay, lace and petticoats and like high society dissension is, you couldn't be further away from post-Taliban Afghanistan. Um, but we started talking about it a little bit more. And the way I look at the story, there is a warlord's compound. The warlord is the man of the family. He, his domain is really outside of the home. They control that world. His relationship with different governments, um, he sort of has influences that are more nefarious. But that is his domain. He leaves his home in the compound to the control of his mother. And so Rahima's mother-in-law is really, that's where she exerts her clout and her power. And women have kind of created, you have to create your own world because everybody in this life is really searching for a way to assert themselves. And if all you have is within the home, then that's where it will be. And marriages are also, depending on where you are and where in time you are, they're not really institutions of love all over the world. Sometimes they're institutions of convenience or political arrangement. And they're not really based on romantic desires of women or even practical desires, but women very often fall into them and because those are the obligations that are ascribed to women in certain cultures. So my characters are ruled by worlds that dominated by others. And they're hungry for individualism, as we all are, but there's no room for it. So in a world that keeps telling them, no, 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 you can't, I think those are the people that are bravest among us, the ones that are willing to stand up and challenge the status quo and turn those expectations upside down. And she believes that she's entitled to individualism because there's something inside of her that believes it and because she knows that she's the descendant of someone else who's believed it. So I think there's something to be said about legacy and what you can draw from it. And they spent their entire lives basically seeking that identity of self, which is really what a college student is doing, right? You're taking which classes. Which classes are you going to pick? Well, that's how you sort of express yourself. Um, do I want to take science classes? Am I more of a science mind? Do I want to take literature classes? Do I want to be really practical and take some business classes? And all of that is some soul seeking. Aside from your courses, you have to decide which activities you want to be involved in, which clubs do you want to be associated with. Do you want to join a frat? All of these choices are the person sort of building up their individual experience. And so it boils down to that for me. For Rahima and Shakeba, for Jane Austen, for all of us sitting in this room and all the college students that are sitting on those campuses, that is the search for self. And it happens everywhere. It happens in the mountain villages of Afghanistan. It happens in 18th century high society. And it happens on your college campuses too. 
And so by exposing your students to new places, new ideas, and this world of potential, what you're doing all the time, you are really guiding them through that search for self. So thank you for listening, and thanks for all that you do.